Hello, can everybody see me? I hope so. So uh, yeah, thank you for that introduction. I am the director at the Coot Center and um, I had the fortune of uh, being able to work with Jim Coots for one season before his passing. So uh, he was a very visionary man. And, um, and today I'm gonna focus on the weather at the Coot Center, uh, particularly uh, dealing with the public uh, and the weather. So um, the one thing um, about, the, about the weather is it's, it's always unpredictable. And uh, you always got to be ready for the weather. And it's a state of mind. Um, let's see. Get this going. So the love of weather. We all share a commonality of the weather. For example, you meet a stranger, you often talk about the weather. I mean, I, that's part of, uh, I was in the grocery store today and I was talking to a gentleman about our weather and how icy it's been this this winter, uh, you know, has pointed out, I have a landscape company I've owned for 23 years. And uh, part of our uh, job is having seasonal work. So in the summertime, we're at the Coot Center, but in the wintertime, we do snow removal. This year in particular, there's been a lot of ice, more ice than other winters. So um, that's a sign of changing times. Um, it used to be in the snow removal business, um, you could live off hourly work or, um, by by push they call it which means doing a parking lot for a set cost uh, that's not so much more the case there's just not enough snow so we're doing it uh, monthly now most of our sites to sustain ourselves um, but back to the coot center jim's goof uh good gift to the u of l is important to me and to to enjoy the outdoors and that includes the weather uh weather can uh be a form of expression rain sometimes can be sad or calm Go next one. So this is also a form of expression. Jim, who loved his grandfather so much, he bought back the homestead and all the things he loved, he put into the property. So um, you can see in these images here, the LA uh, right beside it is the grass plots that he loved. Uh, there's an artist painting on an easel. Uh, Jim loved the arts. He did watercolors. There's a picture of a meadow uh, beside the easel and to the right is the poppy garden uh, that's very popular uh, when it's in full bloom. Um, so things like the, the meadow blowing in the, in, the, in, the, in the meadow, like waves of the ocean is something that we always enjoy every summer, me and the staff. Uh, the LA will give us shade. So we had a couple of extreme heat summers. So the gardeners would actually uh, plan their day that in the morning they would work in a full sun exposed garden and then in the afternoon they would work in the LA which actually has a native plant under its smooth aster. Um, so these were some of the things that we would do to work with the weather. Jim had quite the vision for the property. Um, working at the Coot Center has given me an extraordinary life. One of the great gifts is it has given me is the ability to be creative and be different, much like Jim's chicken house, which I grab inspiration from. Um, if you've been to the Coot Center, we have a chicken house uh, that, uh, that at one time had pheasants in it, and even Jim had pheasants in it for a short period. Um, but he converted it into in a public space. Uh, often when I take people in there, they can't believe that that's actually... Uh, was once a chicken house, but now it's used for uh, entertaining and it holds about 60 people. It has a quite low ceiling. So it's, it's, it's ideal for small groups. Um, but uh, here's a picture of Jim with colleagues showing him his, uh, his beloved grasses. So when I came on board, um, it was still a private residence. It was still Jim's residence. He was actually renting the house from the U of L after he gifted it. And he, that was his summer home. He'd come out there every summer. Um, but it was, it, he knew that he needed to uh, make sure that it would continue without him. So he gifted to the U of L and it was to become a public space. So becoming a public space, you need to um, create spaces 
that the public has an expectation on. So um, one of the other things is we needed to become uh, sustainable um, in multiple ways or from a plant perspective, but also from a revenue perspective. So it was quite clear that we needed to build an event space. So um, uh, we had, so we have multiple gardens, meadows, grass plots, all on Jim's original uh, grandfather's homestead, which they homesteaded there in 1904. So we actually didn't start off with event buildings. Uh, we started off with tents. So, uh, and it, partly we did that as a strategy of cost control. Uh, building structures uh, can get very expensive, especially recently uh, with COVID and all that um, and mills slowing down and stuff, lumber prices got quite high. So um, for cost control reasons and just an analysis, we wanted to see what an event space could do um of revenue wise so uh we started with a tents which is probably five percent of the cost of building a building so uh at the beginning we did tents but and you know um the interesting thing about weather with the tents is um it's not designed to be a permanent structure so we had to do with uh, wind rain sun snow um all on the tents during our season and uh there were actually pulling themselves apart because in that image there, you could see we have these ratchet straps that we have to continually tighten to keep the tent tight. But with these weather and some of it's becoming extreme, you know, we're getting, it seems like we're getting extreme heat, uh, extreme rain, um, extreme wind, uh, Lethbridge area, which not is an hour away from is known for wind. Um, you know, these are all hard on, structures or plants. So um, the tent was actually getting stressed from the elements. So I went to one of the manufacturers and said, you know, like I need to come up with a solution because it's getting to the point where the weather is uh, destroying the tents. And he had a quick answer with me without hesitation and told me the problem is, is you're using a temporary structure as a permanent structure. So that was a turning point for me. I knew that this wasn't the solution, the long-term solution. So um, we got to a point where we were showing good revenue and the tents were at their end. So it was time to build a permanent structure. So when building a permanent structure, I, need, I wanted to take into consideration uh, Jim's vision. So Jim, uh, every, the buildings he built at the Coot Center are all uh, historical or replicas of a certain time per early century. So uh, the house is from 1904. Um, the chicken house, you know, it's it's a, it's it's a, it's a repurposed building, but it's it's a, it's a mixture of early century and modern. Um, and then uh, and our, our south barn is very similar. So I knew that the building where we're going to build would have to fit in with the property. And we, we often talk about visual balance on the property too. Jim talked about it and I continue to talk about it. You need to make sure that the structures have visual balance with everything else going on in the property. So my inspiration after doing much research was a hay shed. Uh, some of the other properties, which I think are beautiful too, but you know, a lot of people do barns and stuff like that, but they're quite dark inside and I and they're closed off to the elements, to the outside. So my inspiration was a hay shed. So I wanted an open concept building. So you could see on the image on the left, you could see how the public is free to wander in and out of the building and feel the elements of the outdoors, whether it's rain, sun, sunsets. So I wanted to do time period correct as much as I could. So I wanted to use canvas sides. I did research on hay sheds and some of them used canvas sides uh, to protect the, the feed. So, um, I also liked the opportunity presented to do shadow art. So this is uh, the LA, the elms, and the shadows, early morning shadows on the canvas. It's quite, quite nice on the inside of the building. So as I was saying, uh, one of our um, bigger or more often um, things we have to deal with at the Coot Center is wind it's noticeable out there. Uh, if you live in other regions of the country or, or even Northern Alberta, uh, you don't, there's wind, but you don't notice it. It's when you uh, 
work in Natton or even in the Crozenus Past or Lethbridge, the wind is noticeable. You literally get out of your house and you think there's the wind. So it's a constant. It's something we have to um, be aware of and, and even um, make it to our benefit. So um, this is an image of a windy day, even though it doesn't really show it, but um, those canvas sides are blocking out the wind coming from the west. And yet we're still open on the east into our event space. Um, that's the beautiful thing about the canvas. It has the ability to uh, open with sides uh, and close off sides to block the wind. And then the building started to evolve. Um, the way the building is designed, it's an A-frame and the water comes straight off the roof. And it, with those open sides, you take the risk of rain uh, hitting our guests. So um, I found these train station corbels from, uh, and they were original train station corbels about a century ago. I think it was like 1930s um, from Two Hills. Well, Jim's grandfather opened the train station in Natton. So I thought, you know, anything we could do historical work for Western Canadian heritage, that's in our name, um, I want to do. So I salvaged these uh, train station corbels. They're actually going to go into the burn pile. And then, uh, and then I had hired a, a local carpenter to uh, build replicas and rebuild the existing ones. So we have half and half. We have six replica and six original uh, train station corbels from two hills. So you can see it here in the image and these are the train station lights we added. So then the next challenge uh, that ended up happening becoming an outdoor venue in an open space. And as was pointed out in my introduction, like I worked in the hotel business as a head uh, gardener and I saw the difference of an indoor venue versus an outdoor venue, same with the golf course industry. Uh, there's definitely uh, weather challenges is the big one with an outdoor venue. Uh, we often have people that uh, want to come out. They, they like the fact of having an outdoor booking, um, you know, but sometimes uh, you don't get perfect weather. Um, so because of that, you can't stop the booking. It has to go on. And then people um, need to use the property. So this is picture here is actually of wear patterns. What, what often causes wear patterns, and you see it a lot in the golf course industry, is people continually walking in the same spot. Now, turf grass can manage it um, if you can control it. But our space is quite small. And the people are actually walking in the low spot just naturally to the tent. So um, wear patterns come from uh, saturated soils and then you're walking on it. So those saturated soils, the clay particles, their soil particles actually become um, like lubricant. And then when you walk on it, you actually compact it, which takes away our, our air spaces and water spaces for plants to grow. So then they die off. Um, another thing that could cause it is drought because the plant can't, uh, it's not, uh, photosynthesizing without water. So then uh, you, your, the foot track will literally wear the crowns right off the grass, the pile plants. So uh, that's another thing. Uh, one thing that I didn't write down here, but another thing that's often is top kill. You know, people bug spray or spilling their hot drinks will kill the top of the grass. So the plant is set back and then you walk on it. And so these are all contributing factors of wear patterns. The difficulty with wear patterns is they're just not, you, you got to deal with them. They're not attractive. They, um, they cause a hazard. In this day and age, we need to be very aware of our hazards. The people are more aware of weather hazards and uh, the golf course I work at had an alarm system when, the, when there was thunderstorms. You know, we need to make sure that uh, we make it as safe as possible for the public, the staff, uh, random people, you know, so we are open to the public all the time. So uh, unless there's a booking, so we need to, to notice that, to be aware of that. So, uh, and you can see the tents in the background here too. So this is our early stages of becoming open to the public and then uh, kind of learning as we go and learning about the property itself and how it's controlling uh, the plants and are handling uh, heavy traffic. Um, so the solution, you know, me, I've always liked being creative. Um, it's something I enjoy very much. It's something, 
I, I strive to do in all the stuff that I built. So I was literally looking at the wear pattern and we put mulch down because we had no turf grass left and you can't have your guests walk in the soil and you see mulch often on hiking trails. So we tried that, but um, it actually retains more moisture. So I don't know, it's a tricky balance, right? So, and again, it's cost and timing. So um, I was standing, uh, looking at it and I thought, you know, that looks like a creek. And I thought, you know, maybe there's something there. Maybe we, instead of building a traditional sidewalk, which I did lots of in my landscape uh, contracting days, I didn't want to do what everybody else is doing. Um, I thought, let's do a creek. So preserving the history, our for Western Canadian history, it was important to me that uh, we get rocks from the field. So these field rocks would have been uh, picked in all kinds of weather. Uh, from farmers and settlers. And there's piles, you often see them when you drive through the prairies uh, on the farmland, you'll see piles of rocks and, uh, you know, and uh, and you can see how the times change because they would put them in random spots sometimes, but now with our farm equipment being as large as it is, it's inconvenient for farmers in some of the locations that are piling rocks. So, but they would have picked those rocks in all kinds of weather. In this image here, we're actually harvesting the rocks and you can see a storm brewing in. So these are the rocks from the settlers or the locals, and, uh, and we're gonna use them to build a dry creek to walk on in a rent space. So Jim did something similar or the same in the poppy gardens. So I always um, derive from Jim's vision. So the poppy gardens had the field stones and he made cobble paths, if you will, through the, through the poppy garden. There's only one bad thing, in you know, when he would have done it, it was his private residence, but there's only one bad thing is that we are a public space now and uneven stones are just not acceptable anymore in a public space. You take the risk of somebody getting hurt. So that we couldn't do it the same. And then it came to me that, hey, why don't we build our own cut cobble? And that's what we named it. So there's one of my summer students cutting the stone. So we I literally took a diamond blade and we started cutting the stone. So you can see in these images, different pictures of the stones being cut. So they're cut to the same thickness as a paving stone. So we could use the same practices of installing the stone. And we, when doing my analysis on cost analysis, it's comparable to being precast pavers that we put in the events building. So to me, um, you know, it was feasible. So um, that's kind of the process. And then this is the end result. So um, you could see here how beautiful it turned out. Um, it's a, like a creek, it's flat, you can walk on it easily. Um, I think it's quite beautiful. I get a, a lot of positive feedback on it. And here you can see it at work. So that's the head gardener, Kara Matthews, who does a wonderful job for us. She is walking down the cut cobble during a rain. And you can see how the rain goes down the creek and it falls its way out. We would literally have to rip up the whole events area to redirect that water. And when we have downpours, it comes from all directions. So instead of working against mother nature, we worked with her and we ended up doing this dry creek path. Other things we decided that the, that the event space needed was the bandstand. Jim always wanted a bandstand. So um, it was an ideal fit for the center. So uh, before radios and TV, people would go down to the town center and um, go to the bandstand. And the bandstands were often uh, sheltered um, and elevated platforms. Well, with today's safety standards, we didn't want an elevated platform. So it's ground level. Those rocks in the background are from the field. And I actually designed it so the roof is cone shaped. So it actually holds sound because back then they wouldn't have had, you know, the modern technology that we have today for sound. So it holds sound and it, and it echoes it out. So it's great for live performances. So um, another thing I added in the event space was this greenhouse. So when, uh, and I had this conversation with Jim, uh, we needed to decide in an area on an event space. And he actually did an event before his passing called Concert in the Meadow. And we picked that area that is currently our event space to hold that event. Um, but 
one of the challenges I was faced with, and I and I and I always everything I do, I always think about um, Jim and the university, and, and and that we take that into consideration. Is we had to take out the compost bins and an existing greenhouse. And that was not an easy decision to make, but because I had to make that decision, because the way it was uh, when it was a private residence, it couldn't hold 120 people. And that's what our, what our target market was. So um, I knew that I would someday figure out a way to reincorporate those things into the event space. So one of the um, things why we built the greenhouse is we used to put these 10 by 10 tents out for people to use during events, but uh, to get all the elements. So it's, I, I wasn't a huge fan of the 10 by 10 tents because they're prefabbed and they're not that interesting. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to build a greenhouse to replace those. At the same time, putting the greenhouse back um, and putting the compost back, the bins back. So those cement uh, sections that are in there are the old compost bins, all the windows, the wood siding, the doors, the trusses, those are all um, salvage. The only new stuff is the structure because it had to be new and the poly roof because of hail uh, or extreme weather. I actually put a wind deflector on there too. So yeah, on the top of the roof, can't really see it in that image. There's almost like in the back in the day, people used to put them on their cars and used to put a little deflect, bug deflector or wind deflector on the front of their car. So I did that on the lip of the peak of the polycarbonate um, because of our extreme winds, uh, we could get hundred kilometer an hour gusts. Um, so we always have to be aware of that. We also needed a bar or a concession. Uh, so it's all made out of salvage uh, uh, materials. Uh, so servers or, uh, or, uh, or could get all the elements in there. So, uh, you know, out of the rain and the wind and the, and it's all designed to, to take that into consideration. I enjoy this picture. Um, it, it shows uh, the meadow, which Jim valued so much and I do too, um, but it actually shows um, the meadow showing uh, the shiny side to deflect the heat. And this particular day, uh, it was quite hot. And um, so for plants to uh, protect themselves from um, losing a lot of moisture during heat, uh, they'll actually reflect the sunlight. So the meadow, when you see it shiny like this, or better, or even another example is the elms you can see in the distance, they are showing the backside of their leaves. And that's to deflect the sun. And we're just about to have a midsummer thunderstorm. So that's why it's, it's brewing pretty good right there. So, you know, in closing, I'd like to say uh, for the, lo the love we have for weather, at times we are we feel or are made to feel that human interference is changing the weather. And I'm not an expert on climate change, but I do know this. Many as us has become disconnected with the natural world, introducing plant material and sometimes hybrids that don't perform well. Jim's native plant material, especially native grasses or more so the native meadows, uh, native plants use less human input and have less impact on the planet and are less weather dependent. I'd like to thank Jim for his vision. I'd like to thank staff for being seasonal workers, which means we work in the summer and through the fall and in the winter, we have to adapt our, our lifestyles to be seasonal workers uh, financially and uh, just to be ready for the spring flush, for example, when all the plants are growing like crazy and the gardeners have to step it up because not only are our desirable plants growing really well, but the undesirables are growing really well too and they have to work twice as hard to control. Uh, I'd like to thank the U of L for letting me be creative. They've always supported and um, wanted me to be creative. Of course, my family support. Uh, and I like to thank the public for taking the time out of your busy lives to visit the center and the love of weather. Um, this is a beautiful picture of a sunset. Of prairie sunsets are quite amazing. Um, and a special thank you to Lisa, uh, uh, Josie, and everyone else involved to have me talk today. This is a picture of the tree of life I did with the cut cobble. We took um, 
glass insulators, which were used on power poles so that they don't conduct electricity, so the pole doesn't catch on fire. Um, they've changed it since then. And uh, the farmer up the road gave them to me and said, do you want these? And I said, sure. And then I had this crate of glass insulators sitting in my workspace for months. And people are like, what are you doing with those? And I was like, I don't know, but I need them in my headspace. And then long story short, I decided to make the tree of life. So thank you all for your time. And that's my presentation on the weather and the event space.